Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Well, how is everyone doing this evening? Good. There's got to be more enthusiasm than that if you're here tonight together, have a good time. How's everyone doing this evening? Yeah, it should be, it should be like, a, like a rock concert, you know, a sporting event. If you get hyped up for those, you can get hyped up for this. Uh, well, welcome tonight. Uh, this is my last lecture. And I can see I have some of my students in the audience, so I, see, I think they're here to confirm it. To, so they won't have to show up to class tomorrow or for Friday. But, uh, you know, getting here tonight, people ask me, oh, you're so dressed up, you look so nice. And some people start to say, look, you're going to a funeral. I said, well, if I was going to give my last lecture, I should be dressed up. And if it was my last lecture, you might as well put me in a box and send me down the river because life wouldn't have as much enjoyment anymore. I did announce in my classes that I would be giving my last lecture tonight, and I'm sure some of my students are out partying tonight. But sure enough, I will be in class tomorrow. And I think uh, we'll, the ones that are here will end up learning a little bit of things they could take back to class to say, okay, it, it really wasn't his last lecture. lecture. It was just uh, something uh, proverbial he was mentioning in class to get everyone excited about it. So last lecture, um, when Linda sent me the email, and it said last lecture on it, I did not know completely about the series. And uh, not until I opened my email, a million things started running through my head. And I was like, I just got tenure this past spring. <laughs> I'm not quite sure that's the way tenure works. I thought there was a little more job security associated with it. And so I thought I'd better open the email just in case. And so I gained a little more information about exactly what the last lecture series was all about. And I have to tell you, I'm very thankful and very honored uh, that, that my students, especially selected me to be here and also my colleagues for their support for being here and part of this is being selected as the presidential teacher award from last year so i'm very honored and humbled by that now you see the title from my last lecture fell into teaching best decision i never made i, I can answer that <laughs> it's okay sherry don't worry uh, I, I sometimes do in class. I had a good student, her mom called the other day, and just because I knew her mom, I did answer it in class. She asked me what, uh, what, her, stu what her, her daughter had the phone on in class for. And I said, what are you doing calling her during class? <laughs> if you knew she was in class. So we had a nice little conversation there. I got her probably a little anxious and paranoid, so I told her daughter, just tell mom, it's okay, we're just kidding. Nothing out there. But looking at the title, I fell into teaching, best decision I never, never made. Because being here tonight, I am a million miles, million distance away from what I ever thought I'd be. I never imagined that I'd be teaching. When I was growing up, it was all about going to go out and be a business owner, going to work in corporate America, make all kinds of money, have my first million by 20, second million by 21, <laughs> and just keep racking it in year and year after that. And so there was no doubts in my mind. I was very, very confident about that. And in looking at it, I probably shouldn't have been fighting it because I come from a teaching family. You know, my mom's a teacher, my sister's a teacher, my aunts were teachers, my grandmothers were teachers, and my mom, who's actually sitting in the audience, I'd like to recognize her because uh, it must have been something in the genes. <laughs> now let me have you clap for this. She has taught for 46 years. And So it must, it must have been in the genes, something that I couldn't fight genetically, and this building could probably tell me a little bit more about that. But teaching was never in my future, at least nothing I planned for, and it was n definitely not one of the paths that I took. So one of the things I want to talk to you tonight is be open to taking different paths, because there's something about said to be said for planning, and there's to something to be said about taking risks for not planning. And just let me take you trip back to high school. I was always very entrepreneurial minded. And what was I, about 14, 15 years old? We were in high school, and we weren't old enough to leave. I went to school in Satari. I'm a native of the San Luis Valley from Capulín. Went to Centauri High School. And you want to be cool in high school. You want to leave campus. You want to get out of there and be different. And only juniors and seniors could leave campus to go for lunch. And so we got tired of cafeteria food, and I can remember bringing a lunch one day, and everyone liked my lunch. And I was like, ah, I got an idea here. If I bring five more lunches <laughs> and maybe sell my own, you know, I, I could make this into a profitable venture that's out there. So I did it. And so I started bringing these sack lunches, different variety every day, and this is, blows away Lunchables by far. And 
I start, I start bringing these to school and all my buddies and everything start buying them. Well, then I start taking orders. And so I'm going home every night with a list for mom, telling her everything I have to buy. And she's looking at me, going to the grocery store, spending about $30, $40 and saying, are you sure this is profitable? <laughs> well, I was pocketing everything and luckily I had, a, I had a good financier who was actually fronting me the money for it and everything. I'm probably still in debt to her this day. I don't even want to see those interest payments that I have to be making. And so that went along pretty well until I was getting up at like 6.30 in the morning having to make all these sandwiches, you know, uh, uh, different uh, size, getting drinks and everything. Because remember, these are, this is the days before we have all these conveniences. This is back 93, 94 out there. And, um, and I'm saying, this is a lot of work for a little bit of money. So that venture didn't last too long because I was doing it all on my own. And I had other things better to do. So it comes to my high school year. Now I'm really cool. And I'm really sharp. And... Another entrepreneurial venture comes to mind. I'm in Woodshop. Uh, one of the proudest uh, moments of my life was my senior year. I did not have to take a pencil or a pen to class. I know that's not something good I should be telling a group of students <laughs> in here, but I was very proud of that. I went to the elementary, worked there in the morning, uh, was, was the office aide for the high school office in the afternoon, and at the Woodshop, my last period of, of, uh, of the afternoon. And in Woodshop, people are making shells and different projects and everything out there, and the, and the wood scrap piles would start building up. And I'd see all this scrap wood behind it, and one day, I just started messing around, and I made a smiley face. You know, nice round circle, because someone was making, I don't know, what, speaker cabinets or something. So I poked two holes, got the drill bit, got a little smile on the jigsaw in there, got a string, put it around my neck, being silly, and someone loved it. They said, that is great. And I said, it's great. I said, how much do you want to buy it for? That was the first, que that was the first uh, <laughs> question out of my mouth. And they offered to buy it for $3. And that, I was like, wow, here's another, this is another happening that could be made. So the next day I go back and I start looking at all this scrap wood. And now I have a bunch of employees. And it's free labor. <laughs> the machines are covered by the school. The building's covered by the school. I got all this overhead covered. I learned my lesson from the sandwiches. That I'm not doing it any longer. I have them start making it. So I start getting the orders out there and I got a great spokesperson in Flavor Flav. <laughs> Public Enemy, if you remember back in 1993, very hip, very hot. And you see that clock that's around there? He made it famous. Well, I was using that with not a clock, but all these smiley faces. We went to different expressions on the faces. And these things started to go in five, ten dollars, painted different elements. And I'm making it during shop class. And I think I am going to just strike it rich. And here comes that first million. And I'm not even 21 yet principal comes in. And it's Mr. Kurt Carey, for some of you who know him. I know he's taught here at Adams State College. And Mr. Kurt Carey comes in and calls Mondo over and says, Mondo, we, we, can't, be, we can't be doing this. You know, you can't be selling these, these, these expression faces, whatever they are. You don't know what to call them. I, I didn't even know what to call them either. And, and he said, we got a nix. I said, well, I have all these orders. He said, you got to cancel the orders. The orders are out. So here comes the man government, whatever it is, whatever you want to look at it. I should have asked him, are you Republican? I don't know what I should have asked him at the time <laughs> to see where, where, where is this intervention? I, you know, I had this venture and everything. You know, isn't this a, cap a capitalist society, free, free market system? And he nixed it. So I went to my last entrepreneurial venture. It wasn't associated with the school at all. I started DJing. I've been a mobile DJ for 20 years, still mobile DJ. By the way, Friday night, we got a block party here on campus. Everyone here is welcome to come do some dancing. Uh, shake your thing, whatever you want to do and everything. And especially, uh, it's, it's in accordance with Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, 16 de septiembre, September 16th is coming up this week. So we're recalling it by a festive activity. Then I will also be at the home opener for Adam State this weekend in front of the stadium. So come and support our, the new opening of our new stadium with the whole thing open for our football team, and I got a lot of student athletes who are out there. Uh, I know, I'm in business, shameless plug, right? Shameless <laughs> plug. And so I started doing mobile DJing, so I've always been entrepreneurial minded, always looking for that quick buck. And so it, it, definitely, it definitely was as part of me to find something, do something, go to school. I was very much education oriented, that's a testament to my mom and dad of influencing me and say that's something they can never take away from me. I grew up on a farm and a ranch, so we had a lot of assets. We had a lot of land, a lot of cows, a lot of sheep, a lot of hard work. But they told me the education is the one thing through all of that they could never, ever take away from you. And so I started, I started thinking about that. Okay, I'm going to go out to school. Once I got going to school, um, I went through my undergraduate, got that 
in business administration with an emphasis in management and finance. Went on to my master's in business administration right away. Once I finished that, I started looking for jobs. And if you can remember back to the late 90s, there was this huge technology explosion. I mean, they were just throwing money away, throwing money away. And I can remember going down for job interviews in the Denver Tech Center. And, you know, I interviewed with companies like A.G. Edwards and Arthur Anderson and just seeing some lucrative, lucrative money being offered towards me. And they'd really wine and dine you. You go down there for the day and they'd, uh, you know, show you around, have you meet different divisions. But their biggest mistake is they'd let me go about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm headed back to Fort Collins because I lived in Fort Collins at the time. And I'm headed back there and I'm looking to the left, I'm looking to the right, and I'm looking down at my speedometer and I'm going five miles an hour. And I'm like, how do people live like this? And I'm sitting right there in my vehicle and have this epiphany about this doesn't, I don't care what kind of money they give me, this does not sound like an ideal life. And I start thinking about and reflecting upon what do I really want in life? What do I really want in life? And I said, I want to be home in the valley. I um, want to be close to family. I want to be close to the farm. And so I said, what do I need to do that? There's agriculture, that's down, where I got that covered with the farm and the ranch. But there's also education. Maybe I can take what I've learned and help other people out there. So that's the first lesson I want to give you tonight. Money isn't everything. And that's coming from someone who is a true capitalist, someone who thought money was going to bring all happiness. One of my sayings said that money can't buy you love, didn't have enough. <laughs> and uh, I truly believed in some of those mantras. And things change. Things change. And I tell a lot of my business students is, that, you know, money isn't everything. So look at life out there. What do you want in life is your passions. And go for your passions. And your passion should drive you. And a big part of my passion is my family. Uh, you see right here this beautiful young man that's out there who is also sitting in this room. That's Rodolfo Armando Valdez. He's four years old. Wave, you can wave your, there you go. That's one of my biggest passions in life right there. He uh, definitely influences me and drives me every day. It uh, makes me want to get up in the morning and smile and make him a happy person who enjoys life. Family is a big part of my passion. I told you I was a native of the San Luis Valley. Um, family's been in northern New Mexico, southern Colorado for the last 400 years. So we definitely have a long history of being here. And I'm very proud of the culture and uh, traditions and society that we established and then blended with the United States. When you look back into history and you see how this land became part of the United States, a lot of people have no idea for a long time this is Spain. For 27 years it was Mexico. It became very disputed until the Mexican-American War, Mexican -American War and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo <coughs> brought this to the United States. Another good decision that I didn't have any part of, but I'm <laughs> glad I landed on, on this side because I'm very proud of this country and very proud of the contributions that I make as a part of this country. Uh, cultures, a big part of it. I mentioned to you about Hispanic heritage. I'm, I'm a proud proponent of my Latino and Latina students who are out there. But it's not just them who I'm proud of. It's a blending and understanding of how we also mix with all other ethnicities and the diverse aspects that we have as part of our society. The best thing I have about Adam State is that I look around the classroom and I tell my students, look around your classroom. Look at how diverse this is. Not just in ethnicity, but in age, in gender, in personality, in attitude. There's so much diversity here. And a lot of times we don't realize it and we take it for granted. But it's a key part of who we are, especially here at Adam State. I've taught at Colorado State University. Not diverse. I don't care what they try to tell you. I taught at Front Range Community College. Not diverse. It's a different, different area. I remember trying to tell people of where I was from and living in the Front Range, the world to those people ends at Colorado Springs because <laughs> they have no idea that we're down here. And I used to have to draw them a map. First, I'd, I'd start with Pueblo. Half of the people knew about Pueblo. <laughs> uh, then I'd have to say about 45 miles south of there, you get to Walsenburg. And then you go over the mountain about 71 miles and you get to heaven on earth in the San Luis Valley. Alamos is the center, but that's not where I'm from. I'm from a com little community called Capulín that's out there. Beautiful, sits between two rivers, the Lajera and the Alamosa River. And so that's our second lesson tonight. And hopefully you're taking notes. <laughs> there, there will be a test. <laughs> let your passions, let your passions influence your decisions. You'll make good decisions every time. You know, do what's right. And if you don't know what's right, your passions will help you to tell you what's right that's out there. And so that's, that's a 
very key aspect. But to do that, you have to be able to understand your passions. Transitions are, are also a part of making decisions. Transitions are also part of every aspect of life which is out there. And I've made a lot of transitions, and I've kind of indicated to some of what I'm speaking right now. First of all, I made a transition from the valley to Fort Collins. And uh, talk about a big, huge transition. How many people are from the valley? All right, there's quite, quite a few of you. How many people know where Capulina is? Oh, I love that. I love that. Like I told you before, I'd ask that every time I had a class, when I do my introduction and my spiel at the beginning of every class, and the students who I have kind of know my spiel. Some of you have heard it multiple times and could probably repeat it back to me. But I'd ask that question about Capulina, and I never would get a handout. I think at one time I had a student from Manassa who was up at Colorado State University who actually raised her hand, and I was shocked. And I asked him where, where he was from, and he said, Manassa. And I was like, who are you? And so I had to, got to know him, because there's that kind of kinship, and that's what we get, especially from here in the valley, and especially when you're out of the valley. But I made that transition. I went from going from bizcochitos and tortillas to bagels and smoothies. And uh, I'm still trying to figure out what a smoothie is. <laughs> it's a different set of food, different perspectives on life, but that was a transition. And it's one I had to deal with. And the one that helped, you know, shape and add confidence to me because I found out I could do it. Another transition I made was going from a business in the College of Business at Colorado State University to education. When I decided to say, I'm going to go back to teaching, I said, what do I need? I said, I got to get into a PhD program. And I went to Colorado State University and I knew they didn't have any PhD programs in business, no doctorate programs there in business. And I didn't want to go to the dreaded CU, so <laughs> I, couldn't be, I couldn't become a buffalo. So I said, you know, I'm here in Fort Collins, what do they have? And I thought about education. I want to go into teaching, I really want to go into teaching, I should probably learn a little bit about it. Great decision. Great decision. If I'm an effective teacher today, it's, it's because I went through an education training approach that actually had some formal models, techniques of how to teach that's out there. But the perspectives are completely, completely different. And I'm on the same campus. I'm at going from business, very much about structured, very much about competitiveness, going to education, which is very much about collective-minded, more help each other, driven to help the success of others and not yourself. And it, it changed, changed my whole, whole process. It was partly in my PhD program that's developed my approach into life in many ways. Because I had, I had a very influential professor. It's where I got my research background in qualitative research. And for any of you qualitative researchers out there, you know that qualitative research uses what's called an inductive approach to reasoning, an in inductive, which contrasts to a deductive approach. And I'll look over here to Marty and Matt, because they're very much deductive <laughs> reasoners. They come up with a hypothesis, come up with a premise, and then try to find logical conclusions to try to prove or disprove some aspects of that hypothesis and, and, and premise that's out there. Where inductive reasoning goes into it, not expecting anything. It actually says, clear your mind. You don't want to know anything. You want to go in and see from the observations and from the facts that are out there to see what comes out. And then you're going to draw conclusions from that. You're going to draw conclusions from what actually happened, not set up something that happened before. And that's been er very influential that I go into everything looking at what can I learn? What can I gain from this that's out there? And then I had to go from being in business world, entrepreneurial, to teaching, to where it's not as lucrative as some of the offers that I had before, but it is so lucrative in terms of intrinsic rewards and the people that you meet and the people that you get to help. But in all these transitions, lesson three is be flexible. The key to life is adaptability. Be flexible. One of the greatest compliments that I've been given during my time is that, Mondo, one thing about you, you can relate to someone that's eight, or you can relate to someone who's 80 that's out there. It doesn't matter. You have, you have a complete flexibility in adapting to people and being able to understand them. And so that was one of the great compliments I've had, and I think that's why I've been so successful at teaching. Because especially when I was in a community college environment, I did have students that were 80 years old. I did have students that were also right out of high school. Very diverse, at least in age, in that respect that's out there. Part of the description for this in trying to describe my lecture tonight was talking about multiple realities. And it's a concept that a lot of people just shake their head at and say, multiple realities? What do you mean, multiple realities? Your reality is different than my reality. And you're probably looking at me and saying, what is he talking about? 
because of your reference set, because of the context of what you live in, because of your background of how you grew up, you view the world differently than I do. And we do live in a different reality that's out there. And this came very clear for me when I was probably in my middle teens. I had an uncle from Vermont who's, who's from Vermont, moved out here, went to Adams State College, actually a graduate from here, met my aunt who was going to Adams State College at the time, got married, and uh, settled down in Denver. Both teachers out of Adams State College, so taught, taught you come from a family of teachers. Well, they'd take trips back in the summer and go back to Vermont, and on a couple of those trips, I went back with them. Talk about different reality. East Coast mentality to San Luis Valley, Colorado, completely, completely different. They never heard of an Armando there. <laughs> they could barely say my name. It was always Armando. And I was close if I got it to that point and everything. But they welcomed me in. I was part of their family instantly. I was treated as a son when I went over there. But their mentality was different how they approached. If they thought something, they said it. There was no filter. It came right out. And that, in, in fact, influenced my confidence. Greatly influenced my confidence. Before that, I was much more shy, a little timid, confident in my academics, confident with people once I got to know them. Now when I came back from that, I was confident with everyone. I don't care if you filled a room of 10,000 people or 10 people. I'm going I'm to be confident in talking in front of them. And it was that experience of being in that type of environment that you just said what you want. Be proud of it. If it's right, it's wrong, you say it. Became a big part of my lifestyle. Uh, another key aspect that, uh, ha another dose of different realities. I was in Fort Collins at a grocery store. I think it was at the grocery store. And I was talking with the cashier, and I'm always trying to make small talk with everyone because I'm a very social person. And the woman behind me with a big, bright smile comes up and says, how are you doing? You know, you have a wonderful, beautiful accent. Where are you from? And I have all these things start rushing through my head. I said, beautiful accent? What the hell is she talking about? That's out there. Now, don't get me wrong. I can get that valley, that valley accent going like E bro and bud and everything, and, and we can have that fine. And so maybe there was a hint of that coming out. But all these things start rushing through my head that my reality, my reality and her reality were different. My reality was, this is my ad. This is my place. This is mi tierra. This is my place. And her reality that I was different. I was from someplace else that's out there. And I don't know what came to mind, but I turned to her in a very respectful manner, because I was taught very, to be very respectful to anyone that I come in contact with. Was, with I said, well, thank you, ma'am, but uh, my family's been here for over 400 years. If anyone has an accent, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't think she quite knew how to take that and everything, but I, but I went around it that we do have different realities. And we do live in a world of multiple realities, and I have to respect those different realities. I didn't come away offended from that. I come away from it as a learning experience. And that learning experience was, it is, it is so much different with those realities. And so in those multiple realities that's out there, your next lesson. Learn from others. We learn best through shared perspectives. We learn be best through shared experiences. And, um, you know, I, I, can, I can give a lot of information. But if I could turn to everyone else in the room and get a hundred different perspectives. Just look how much collective experience we, we can share and learn from. And if we learned all that from each other, how much further could we be that's out there? Students come with different realities. Students come with different perspectives. Students come jaded and disenfranchised in some manner. And students come very enthusiastic and anxious to learn and, and engage the content and, and, and get involved. And that's, that's my challenge. I have to continue to work with both groups and continue to work with, how do I get everyone involved that they get away from the class, take away from the class, something that's valuable, that makes them powerful. And a lot of the students in here have probably heard me say that a long time. You learn this, this, this makes you powerful. Not powerful because I want them to be mini dictators of wherever they go. I want them to be powerful that they can go someplace else and make a change, have an impact. And a lot of that's going to be through a lot of the content, shared experiences, perspectives that they learn along the way that's out there. I talked a little bit in the beginning about taking paths that you might not normally take. And for type A personalities, and I don't know if any of you know your type A personality in here, if you're a type A personality, that's very tough to do. Because type A personalities are planners. I mean, I am definitely not a type A personality. I am a type B personality. If I was a type A personality, I probably wouldn't be late to half of the things that I'm, that I'm scheduled to be there for, and I wouldn't forget about the other half of the things that I have available. 
but I'm very a type B personality. But it's going back to my PhD program and learning about that inductive reasoning that I don't, I, I'm not afraid to get off course. I'm not afraid to try a new path because again, maybe my passions are starting to influence my decisions that are out there. And this, this path right here, maybe the one most influential in my life, has been one of the best decisions I've never made that's out there. And so I tell students, when you come to school, don't think that from the first day that you have to have your whole future planned out for you. When you're here in classes, take that first year, try some different classes that you never thought. Take a math class. <laughs> take a science course. Because that's one of the things that they tell me. Oh, I don't like math. I hate math. I teach an operations management class. And today, Max can tell you, you know, from class, and Kim can tell you from class. I took them to a site called mathisfun.com. And you, too, can believe math is fun and go there. You don't believe me? Go try it out. And it's got a whole new world out there. And that's a path that's not normally taken by a lot of students. But I tell them, take that first year because the decisions you make over these next four and five years do shape a lot of the decisions and impact a lot of the aspects of your life. It influences your career. It influences potential family life. It influences friends that you network and, and could uh, generate for business opportunities in the future. There's, there's a lot of things that happen in these four years. Don't try to rush it. That's the other thing I try to tell them. Why do you want to get out of school so fast? There's nothing but a lot of work out there. <laughs> these are the best times. When else are you going to be able to go to Beer Bust, you know, and not wake up till 1 o'clock the next morning? That's never going to happen again. You know, college is, is wonderful, and you learn so much from it. And so part of it is take chances. And I put this in my syllabus. So even though I'm putting in my last lecture, I would repeat it again to everyone. And I have it in there that take chances, take educated risks. And I tell them it's about taking educated risks because while you're in school, I want you to learn how to learn. It's not about content. It's about process. I want you to gain a process of learning, process of critically analyzing, a process of co conceptual thought. Because you're going to be able to go out and find all the content you need if you know how to do those things that's out there. So I want to teach you how to learn and give you a process of how to learn. But the thing that I tell students, I see them being so passive. Don't be passive. Don't wait for life to come to you. Take those risks, take chances, because nothing in life is certain and nothing in life is guaranteed. But I say educated risks, not stupid risks. Walk into oncoming traffic on I-25, that's a stupid risk <laughs> that's out there. I want you to use those skills you gain from your education to critically analyze those conceptual skills, to make determinations on taking a chance that's out there. So that's a big thing. Uh, one thing that served me very well in my journey to life, learning from others, taking chances, is being respectful along the way. Being respectful and be polite. It's those simple things you learn from a very young age. I didn't learn them in kindergarten because I had learned them before that. I came from a yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am kind of family. You hold the door open. You help others if, uh, if, if, uh, even if you're late. And so maybe that's, that's contributed you know, to, to, my, uh, to, my, to my demise of being late. So maybe you just help people. You just help people. Because guess what happens? If I help someone and I'm five minutes late, I guarantee you the world hasn't ended. It's, it's been much better, and I've met a lot of neat people along the way. And so, as, as part of this, enjoy life and being happy, being polite, being respectful. That helps you get there. That helps you get there. There's a lot of reciprocity in helping others. You know, it's not just giving, giving, giving. It's also what you get out of the, that development and that process of helping others that out there. That's what I love about the learning process, because I don't teach my students. My, my students teach me half the time. And teaching is, is not lecture and dissemination of knowledge. It is that reciprocity, and I'm part facilitator. I'm just a guide, and they help get me to places that's out there. And so I'm, I'm, in, I'm enjoying, enjoying this ride, enjoying this journey. Be grateful. Uh, be thankful. Be humble that's out there. For those of you who are psychology, maybe heard of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, if you're taking a simple Psych 101 class, and it talks about those needs level that are there. It starts with physiological needs to where we need, you know, just food, water, shelter, basic things just to, just to live. And most of us, fortunately enough in this country, do not have to worry about those aspects. Although I did see that we have more people below the poverty line yesterday than ever before, so maybe we ought to look about helping some other people around us if, if you are that fortunate. Second level talks about security needs. Security talks about not only feeling safe, but also about having the money to pay for bills, being able to put on the electricity, 
you know, just, just having a, an income to take care of your family or take care of yourself. Next level are social needs. You want to have people around you. You want to make friends. You want to be in environments. We want to go places that are popular, like the last lecture at Adams State <laughs> on September 14th. You know, that's, that's part of that social need that's out there. Facebook tells you where a lot of people are in that social need out there. they got to be in that Facebook area. And then there's esteem needs. I need achievement. I need to be recognized. I need to be know, told that I'm better than everyone else out there. And then finally, there's self-actualization. To be the best you can be for yourself. To do the best you can. Not because of those accolades, not because of the recognition, not because other people are watching. But it's because it's the right thing to do that's out there. And I wish we could get more people to that self-actualization level. And they would start enjoying life much more. So at the conclusion, I know I'm probably running over time. But let's get to work. If you're coming to a last lecture, oh, I forgot about my microphone. If you're coming to a last lecture, st are we still on? Okay, good deal. If we're coming to a last lecture, I've got to get you involved because it comes back to that previous lesson where I said we learn best through shared perspectives. And what I do best is be a facilitator in class and find and learn from you. So I'm going to turn it back to you. And I'm going to facilitate as, as I do in the classroom and pose the question to you. What's a passion you have in life that influences your decision? And who's going to be the first risk taker to give me that answer? Passion. passion. Yes, sir. What's your name? Joe. Joe, tell me about your passion. My passion is writing and professional wrestling. All right. Who's your... <laughs> right on. So who's your... Who's your who, is it like WWE type of wrestling and everything? You have a favorite wrestler there? Uh, He's our favorite wrestler, okay. Yeah, but I'm not talking like Coco Beware or Andre the Giant, you know, Hulk Hogan, you know? The Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Woo! That's what we got to have. I should have brought a boa tonight, you know? I'd be much better. Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero, all right. That's good wrestlers, good wrestlers out there. Thanks, Joe. That's a good passion. How does it influence your decisions in life? Um, Writing, especially, or wrestling, whichever way? Uh, well, writing definitely, I think, is something that gives me. Um, an opportunity to look back at my own voice once in a while and what I'm offering to people, whether it's entertainment or whether it's a, a thought on something or whatever. So I'm very thankful to have writing in my life. Yeah. Writing is a great passion to have. You can share a lot with a lot of people. I've had uh, difficulty over time doing my own writing, especially with my dissertation. And uh, one thing that people told, one thing that was given to me once upon a time was if you write something, and you share it, you can share it with thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even millions of people that's out there. I was like, but I love being in the classroom and impacting those one-on-one -on -one relationships that are out there, too, and everything. But thank you, Joe. Who's got another passion? What's your name? Stacy. Stacy. What's your passion? I'm an animation gamer and a cosplayer. Okay. Which is the greatest passion out of there? Do you have one? Cosplaying. Oh, really? The absolute best. Okay. Why? What is it, how does it influence your decision? It tells me I can do whatever I want to if I put enough work into it. It will come out at the end. Yeah. Redo it a dozen times to get it right. It will come out. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long have you been playing? Um, so I've been cosplaying. I've been in the thing about probably five or six years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a good deal. And we learn a lot. And one thing I didn't mention about making mistakes. And it's a good way to, to try and repetition over and over. If you make mistakes, you can learn a lot of valuable information from it. And I especially tell students in the classroom, Let's make the mistakes here. They don't cost you anything. You already paid your money. Your ticket's been punched. So decisions that we make here in this classroom don't cost you $50,000 or $100,000 like they do out in real life. This is where we want to make the mistakes and learn from them and go on. One more passion. Who's got another passion that's out there? Ted. I have a passion in helping people. Helping people. I guess, and I've been at that for quite a few years. But the, uh, it gives you a great feeling you get up in the morning and when you leave work, you have not looked at the clock to see what the hours are and if they've just flown in each you have more. Absolutely. And you, and you wonder sometimes <laughs> how, how the time passes so quickly yeah. and then at the end you didn't even seem like you've worked. Yeah. Ted Morrison is a very good friend, works down in the southern part of the valley and Antonito, he's a physician's assistant, uh, is it Guadalupe Clinic? Guadalupe Clinic for, and I've been in the PA for 44 years. 44 years, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Helped a lot of people in the valley, and a, and a lot of people know Ted. We were riding the parade this summer and everything, and his uh, 50, 55 and a half, what was it, 54, 54 and a half truck that's out there. 
And everyone was, Ted, Mondo, Ted, Ted, Mondo, Ted, and everything. So you can definitely tell the people that you impact that's out there and everything. We both decided we didn't want to run against each other for office. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a tough one. My machine would have to work a lot harder against Ted's machine. That's it. So he's a great friend. The other thing, what's, who's taken a chance and done something completely different that they've never, never done before? What was your name? Kathy. Kathy. Yes, Kathy. Um, She's I, a PA too. I have to bought myself to Honduras, a, a very rural part of Honduras, to work in a hospital for three months. And um, <coughs> never done anything like it before. And it was very challenging emotionally and mentally and intellectually. And uh, about halfway through, I thought I'd never do it again. And now that I'm back, I'm ready to do it again. Well, great. <laughs> well, great. But you, you didn't know until you went and tried it, right? Yeah. So two things. Yeah. Different, different path. Took risks. It's a big thing. One more. One more. Who's, got, who's done something that they never thought they'd ever do? This could be bungee jumping, too. Come on, guys. There's got to be something out there. Go. No risk takers? No risk takers? Linda. I was in performance art lab. Wow. Yeah. yeah. What role did you play? Well, um, was it a role? Was it acting? In front of an audience, which I just thought was just a piece I had that I made up with my, my stuff in my foot. Oh, really? Which is fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> you got it right there. Maybe we should open it up and yeah. see what's going on there. <laughs> see what's happening there that's out there. I can remember the first time I got in a roller coaster, and there's a commercial out now of that guy screaming, you know, because it's not the manly thing to do. That was totally me. And I said, I'll never get on a roller coaster. Don't like them too fast, everything. I love them. I'll go to every theme park now. I'll still scream, don't get me wrong. But I absolutely love them that's out there. Well, I want to thank you guys for being here tonight. Uh, last lecture experience was absolutely wonderful. And it was wonderful not because of me, but because of all of you. You guys are part of my journey. I have wonderful, wonderful students who are a part of that journey. Definitely enrich my life. I definitely want to thank mom. I and mean, her influence and genetic connection has me here right now. We talked about reality earlier tonight. I'm going to turn it over to my wonderful colleague here in a few minutes, Dr. Carol Gadetto Murphy, to talk about imagination. So that should enlighten us even more. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Adam State College. Great stories begin here.